sat down with Ethan and I said, uh, hey, uh, I can recognize a pattern as well as the next person, and I've noticed a pattern that emerges in these conversations. Uh, and there were two distinct things that I noticed uh, that uh, came from our homeless community, that came from our residents, that came from our business owners, that came from our community leaders, that, that, that kind of kept being repeated. And, and one was that we can do better. Uh, we're Sarasota, uh, we're very proud to be Sarasota, and we can do better than what we've been doing. Uh, we just feel it. And they took it a step further even to say what better looks like, and, and what better looked like was to improve our quality of life. Uh, businesses wanted a better quality of life, residents wanted a better quality of life, the homeless wanted a better quality of life. We all sat at the table and said, hey, we want a better quality of life. And uh, that's kind of where the light up went off for me and I said, hey, quality of life is a chamber of commerce thing, it's a business community thing. Uh, at our chamber of commerce, our tagline is good life, good business. And the idea that is that a good quality of life and a good business community are inextricably connected. You can't have one without the other, it's symbiotic, you know. And uh, I told that to Ethan and he laughed and he goes, you know what the funny thing uh, that will resonate with the business community is that it's costing us an awful lot of money to have a poorer quality of life. And how do we develop a framework uh, that better reflects the quality of our community into the lives of others in ways that kind of proactively build a response to those things that have a negative impact on our quality of life. And when I say our, I mean our. Every piece of our community is part of our community. There's not an us and a them, there is no separation. Everybody who's here is here. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's important to, to, to recognize. So for me, and, and in the business community and the conversation we had this morning, and what I'll, I'll leave you with as you go through the program today is to look at it under that scope in, in, in when we think about the responses that we're able to have, what are those things that uh, increase the quality of life across the board for all of us here in Sarasota and how are we addressing those things that might negatively impact the quality of life because if there's one thing that we always hang our hat on in our community is a really strong quality of life whether we're promoting it to tourists whether we promote it internally amongst our business community amongst people we try to attract here uh, amongst our educational facilities it's all about quality of life the first thing we're encouraging is decentralized coordinated entry which means that we have a great system thanks to Suncoast Partnership to End Homelessness and Leslie, we have a great system with HMIS. We need to empower more teams within the community to be able to meet people where they are. Our call is to meet the person, not the problem, serve the person, not the population. The second point is how do we map the resources that we currently have? Thankfully, we have a lot of agencies within the community that do great work. There's some agencies that could do more work if funding was available. Jack, you won't mind me picking out mental health. But Lord knows, if we had a funding source, and we're, we're trying to get him six more caseworkers for mental health, is how do we resource the services that are here in order to do that? And then the third part is how do we have a mitigation committee to mitigate those who needs don't meet the resources? And what we recognize is, is that with the services, the number one issue that we don't have, I would argue, is housing options that allow people to be diverted into housing instead of shelters. And so we know that we can do it for families. How do we use the same process for individuals? So that when we look at an individual, our response is, is individuals should be housed. And how do we get them to housing as quickly as possible in a way that's responsible? And so that brings us to our guest uh, speaker today, uh, Greg Shin. We've invited him in as an intentional antagonist. So we brought him in to bother us so that we might be a catalyst for better solutions. So that we might be a catalyst in the right direction because we know that there's a need. In Central Florida, which he'll talk about, he's done what I would consider the, the best benefit cost analysis that I've seen, you'll see that this morning, is to look at the benefits of housing people as quickly as possible and how that decreases the cost on the community. But I know that we gather together because we're friends of humanity and we fight together forward because we believe in the progress of humanity, that we might be, uh, that we might be humane to those that we meet. And so with that, I give you Greg Shin, who will lead us in today's conversation. Please help me greet him. Thank you for having me into your beautiful community. This really is a wonderful community, and it's rich in a lot of resources, uh, not just financial resources, but it's got a very rich fabric 
of, of the community here and the quality of life is very high. So I think what we're talking about is helping increase the quality of life for those that are the least advantaged among us. There's all these sectors that are all part of the war on homelessness. And it takes everybody to solve the problem as a community, which does increase the quality of life for everybody. So what I'm going to focus on is, is how we've been able to operationalize that at the Mental Health Association Oklahoma, all across our community, um, the models that we've been able to develop, the strategies that we've learned by hard-fought experience have really effective outcomes, and also what is the return on the investment. Even in a rich community like this, the resources are still limited, and you want to make the most effective use of the resources that you do have. And you want, to, you want to know from the beginning that the strategies you're implementing will be effective. And if we don't work on this now, 10 years from now, you'll be talking about the same problem. Does anybody in here want to do that? Do you want your officers on the police force to, re, to be responding on Central Avenue to the same guy now that's there 10 years from now? Or hospitalizing the same guy 10 years from now that still doesn't have a place to live? When Ethan says we can do better than that, that's what we're talking about. What I'm talking about really is a long-range strategy, okay? It can, be, it can start having an immediate impact, but these are long-term solutions that lead to long-term outcomes, okay? So this isn't going to happen overnight. If you're frustrated that it's not here right now, that's okay. I understand that. Um, and it's not something that's going to disappear immediately, but by working together across these sectors, we can put these, these solutions into place. So we talk about three things, providing access to affordable housing for those people that are homeless right now, both families and individuals. And I would argue with Ethan a little bit that the answer is the same. The answer is affordable housing whether we're talking families or whether we're talking individuals, and the problem is there's not enough of it, okay? So uh, we also talk about preventing additional homelessness because you can house every single chronically homeless person that you know in this community, and one of the steps is that you need to know each one of those people, and you need to know them as unique individuals and what their issues are and how to solve their particular problem and what housing will work for those people. And you can house every one of them, okay? But if you don't prevent additional homelessness, you're never gonna get to what we call functional zero, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, okay? so. And at the same time, what we're doing is preserving the existing affordable housing stock in the community, which is at risk of being redeveloped through gentrification and through urban renewal, further pricing those people who are on the margins out of the housing market, further excluding them from being access to what already exists. Those are the things that we talk about. We talk about provide, prevent, and preserve. And we do that by using a mixed income and mixed population model where we create access to units of housing for people that are homeless and chronically homeless, both families and individuals, as well as people that are on the margins and, and at risk of becoming homeless and are excluded from the housing market. People that are going through the specialty courts like veterans court, drug court, mental health court, people that uh, are excluded from the housing market and if you don't have landlords that rent housing to these people some of who may have criminal histories you're not solving the homeless problem because those are the people that are going to quickly fall through the cracks okay people with with very limited financial resources people with no family connections people with criminal histories people with substance abuse disorders and mental illnesses that fall through the cracks and end up on the streets You've got to address the front door and the back door at the same time. Uh, in Tulsa, we've been working at this for 25 years. And I told you this is a long-range strategy. Okay, so over those 20 years, uh, we started in 1990 with our first property. We've, we've developed 
23 locations of affordable housing in 16 different neighborhoods across the city of Tulsa, okay? And so uh, that's 800 and, well, it's actually a little less than 890 units because we've actually sold some properties and next month we're buying another new property and that's all about location and neighborhoods that we want to be in. So we've gone up and down, but I think by the end of the year, we'll probably be possibly even above 900 units, and I think in the end, we'll be somewhere above 1,000 total units. In, in Tulsa, we did our own economic impact study where we showed how much more it costs to allow people to be chronically homeless on the street, cycling through incarceration, emergency transports, emergency room visits, um, shelter stays, um, and acute inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations and medical uh, hospitalizations for chronic diseases that are untreated, okay? And they just cycle through this system into the hospital, out, get arrested, back out, emergency transport, back out into the shelter for a while, back out on the street, and it becomes this vicious cycle that has huge public costs associated with it versus providing the solution to the problem, which is housing plus services, which in the end, when you add it up, it's far cheaper than allowing somebody to go through that emergency response institutional stay system. The measurable outcomes are, are what you see up here. Reduction in shelter use, reduction in emergency services, reduction in hospitalization, reduction in law enforcement transports, incarceration, drug treatment, and so forth. Because the evidence shows that when people are in housing, all of this drops dramatically. I've been learning about the, is it the Marbot report, Dr. Marbot, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It sounds as I've heard though, about it. Well, a lot of money, time and effort, and I guess a lot of people here were involved with that. And it sounds to me a lot of the same questions and answers are going to come up with yours. I don't know, though. That failed because it got stuck. People, some people <coughs> didn't seem to want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, not in our backyard. That It seemed that they wanted right. to have two to big places, so you're going to go for small community. I just don't know whether you can address it if you don't know what the report is about, but a lot of people here will, um, going down the same road, how to get through the opposition that obviously some people have. Most all the rest of what we've done has been through acquisition and rehabilitation of existing affordable housing, and so therefore it's already multifamily housing, you're not changing the intended purpose of it, you're there by right, it's zoned correctly already, and you're an available buyer on the market using both public and private resources to do that. So after people are housed, they have the ability to do what's up here on the screen now, which is get an income, pay taxes, get a job, if they can work. Some people are really disabled and might not be able to go back to work, but they can still have a place in the community. They're purchasing goods and services in the neighborhood where they live now, they become good neighbors, they contribute to the community, and they're not congregating downtown. I told them we wanted to create another 511 units of housing. We came up with that 511 units based on our chronic homeless counts of the last several years, which showed we had about 230 chronically homeless people in Tulsa. This region, the last count was 270. So I would say it's very similar to what the Tulsa count was at the time. We said we want to do a mixed income, mixed population model, which we, means that we need way more units of housing than what the chronic homeless count is, because we want them to be blended back into the fabric of the community, living alongside everybody else in various neighborhoods, different types, styles, and locations of housing. So the chamber uh, did an economic impact multiplier model for us and said that if you do that, first of all, it's going to cost you with a blend of new construction and acquisition and rehab strategies. Uh, we're estimating about $44,000 per unit to create that housing. I think the price will be a little bit higher here based on my original analysis of the market, but not that much higher. Maybe fifty dollars to $60,000 a unit you can redevelop affordable housing that exists in the community. And our chamber also said, oh, by the way, if you do the 511 units of housing, both with new construction and acquisition and rehab, you're going to create X jobs in the community while you build this affordable housing portfolio and create access for the homeless. And those jobs will have 
this amount in, in estimated direct earned income as well as taxes paid back into the community. As well as then we found that once we actually had the housing on the ground, we were able to leverage millions of dollars of other grants, both public and private, back into the community once we actually had the housing. So, so it's a formula that you, you measure the costs on the homeless side, those public costs that you're incurring and that you're all paying for right now to, while you allow the homeless problem to exist in your community. And then you, you uh, contrast that with the uh, projections for the positive economic impact associated with the portfolio of affordable housing that you're going to create over time and what the economic impact of that is. So you add the whole formula together and as you're doing it and implementing it, you're tracking the outcomes and the re return on the investment as you're building the project and that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years in Tulsa. You won't be able to stop everybody from going into homelessness, okay? But if you have enough affordable housing and the access is there, you can more readily absorb those that do get into these crisis situations. That's kind of the end goal. And determining what that gap is, is what's unique in each community. It has to be based on your local numbers, your local needs, the programs that you have, the people that you see walking in through your doors, meeting the needs of those specific individuals. A lot of what I'm talking about will translate over, the same practices will work, but you still are going to have to put your own unique community spin on it. That's why you got to have everybody at the table working on the solutions together. It was just the last six to eight years that we made this huge surge, okay, it was when the community saw the return and then they really invested in it, okay? And our average cost per unit with the $36 million was $44,100 per unit and that includes the new construction that we did which cost $125,000 per unit all the way down to as low as $9,000 a unit when we bought blighted properties and then put a lot of money rehabilitating a lot of money per unit in rehabilitation of those properties. And this shows how our chronic homeless count dropped. We started at 230 and then we've been below 100 now for six years in a row and we're trying to close that front door with implementation of rapid rehousing and the VI SPDAT coordinated assessment, um, coordinated decentralized entry system that Ethan is talking about. And we're still struggling to get to zero, but this puts us among the leading communities across the country in how close we are to ending chronic homelessness, which included last year we only had 15 chronically homeless veterans when we did our count, I believe. The 2015 count, that number could be zero, but we don't have those results in yet, but I'm hoping it's closer to zero. It shows that the, the total amount that we've spent and invested and the grants that we leveraged back, $52 million in grants that we never would have received if we weren't getting this affordable housing on the ground. That includes, that includes grants for capital improvements as well as grants for services to provide to the same people. That's housing and services grants leveraged back, okay? And when you add all that together, then the total value of our campaigns over time is approaching $80 million. Since if I can say that it costs $10,000 per year less to house a chronically homeless individual in Sarasota, every year I keep that person in housing that he doesn't re turn back to homelessness, I can count that $10,000 as a public cost avoided. And every unit of housing I develop to house that population, I can capture the economic development that goes along with that, and I can keep adding that upon itself every single year. And then I can go keep going after those resources and let resources that are additional available, apply for them and leverage them back to the community. So the whole thing is really a win-win for everybody. It's a, winner, it's a winner for the person who's homeless on the street right now, the family that's trapped in the motel room temporarily that can't get out of that situation, uh, the kids that are in this school and have to move and move and move because the families get evicted because they're priced out of the market over and over again, destabilizing neighborhoods, leading to higher dropout rates and so forth. So, so it's really a long-range community plan for neighborhood stabilization that is a it's a winner for everybody.
the downtown business community benefits because the visibility of those chronically homeless people has dropped. Those people are now in housing. Really, all sectors win, and everybody can invest in this and see the return on the investment over time.